the first point to make is evolutionary wise, we're only designed to function well for 30, 40 years wandering around a jungle with a spear. And then when you hit 50 and the hormones go south, everything wears out pretty quickly in most people. And here's the problem. Many people are spending the last 20 to 30 years of their life in the misery of some chronic illness. And, and so by the time people are hitting 60, they've got some chronic complaint, whether it be obesity, diabetes, hypertension, arthritis, the, com the common ones that people get. Then you lead on to the more serious things like heart disease, cancer, cognitive impairment leading on to Alzheimer's disease, osteoporosis, all our common killers, which all have a very strong genetic basis, but also are related to the fact that we're living well beyond our use by date, which is about 40. A lot of people don't realize that osteoporosis starts at age 30. 30 is the peak of our life. Sarcopenia, which mo most people don't even know what it is, nor talk about it. Sarcopenia is loss of muscle mass. And we need strong muscles to support our bones. So the osteoporosis and sarcopenia go together, start at age 30. If you look at all high-performance athletes, they're not as good in their 30s as they were in their 20s because things are just starting to change from about age 30. So I think we, we really have to look at, at anti-aging. We have to look at what we can do to stop the aging process or slow it down so people aren't spending the last 20 to 30 years of their life in the misery of chronic illness. And that's what health span's about. You, you can live to 80, but have 20 years of, of pretty miserable existence, going to doctor after doctor, taking pill after pill and having procedure after procedure, or you can live to your 80 to 90 to 100 and have a very good quality life. And, and there are many ways to achieve that. How do you feel about intermittent fasting? Because again, there is just such a body of work Sure. Um, speaking to your point precisely that we need to eat less and that yep. intermittent fasting gives us an opportunity to do that in a really easy, free way. What do you say to that as an integrative cardiologist? Well, Baha, I, I think that's a magnificent point you're making and, I, and I'd like to explore that a little bit. Where if, if you think about it, I said right at the start, we were designed to wander around a jungle with a, a spear for 30, 40 years. That's our evolution. Our evolutionary biology is to be hunter-gatherers. We haven't changed much over the past 10,000 years. And what did they do? They'd see an animal, they'd kill the animal, they'd eat it straight away because there were no prehistoric kelvinators, because the animal went off, you don't uh, eat the thing immediately. And when you didn't have that sort of food, that big feast, you just fed off a few nuts and berries off the trees and drank water from the local, local watering hole. So basically they practiced intermittent fasting. So, so they, they would have a big meal when it was available, but it might be two or three days in between big feeds. Well, what do we do? We have breakfast, lunch, dinner, sit in our backsides all day. And we wonder why we put on weight. And we wonder why we get diabetes. It's all very bad for your metabolism. So I, I think People should practice a couple of days a week. You don't need to have a you don't need to have a, a strict regimen for all this, but a couple of days a week, just to, to have days where you don't eat much. And also, this time restricted eating is a good idea as well. Don't have breakfast some days. Start eating at twelve. Have your your last meal at six. So you have a long fast that day. That will help you lose weight. I, I saw a man the other day. Uh, this just on Monday who had lost 50 kilos, 50 kilos in three years. I said, how did you do it? And he said, counting calories. So I know that sounds pretty banal, but there is a, a new app called Alfred, where you can actually take a picture of the food you eat and it estimates the amount of calories in that food. So instead of looking up how many calories there is in this meal, they, this, app, this app allows you to take the picture and you can see what you're eating. And he said, just by estimating his calories, he realized how much unnecessary food he was eating, cut it down to about 1500 calories a day, which is not much at all, I've got to say, but he's lost 50 kilos and his health has turned around markedly by losing weight. So yes, I agree with intermittent fasting. I think it's a good thing to do, but it's basically just don't eat so much. You, you think about now, one of the solutions to morbid obesity is a mutilating operation on your stomach where they reduce it down to the size of a banana. It's called gastric bypass surgery or gastric reduction surgery. And that stops you from eating so much. So just going back to the, what, the conversation here is about an ageless lifestyle, health span and lifespan. And yes. 
you know, the exercise, even if you just do it purely for, you know, any one of those things that you just listed, it's worth it. Oh, absolutely. And osteoporosis, 50% drops your blood pressure and you sleep better. There is no pharmaceutical pill known to man that comes anywhere near exercise as a benefit. The only drug better than exercise is a thing called happiness. And people who are happier, people who enjoy their lives, people who get on with the people around them. So, for example, a 75-year study from Harvard University showed the one key to health and happiness is to have someone else in your life who loves and cares for you, who you love and care for. It's better than your damn cholesterol level. So if you do those five things well, those five keys to a healthy life, which I say to all my So patients, the final key is happiness, just happiness, to be yeah. clear. Yeah. So you do those five things well, that's 80% of your management, that reduces your risk for cardiovascular disease by 83%, cancer, 70%. And if you take a statin drug to lower your cholesterol, that's about a 20% reduction in one disease, a heart attack. That's it. So what, why people will come in with a big fat gut or a cigarette hanging out of their mouth and say, doctor, I need more of that Lipitor or that Crestor. And I say to them, what's going on in your skull? You've got the real key to good health. But the problem with that, Baha, is it requires discipline and perseverance. And most human beings are, are, are lazy and they don't want to do it. So if I, if I suggest any program to anyone, after 12 months, 50% of people have stopped. The adherence to, to medical programs, integrated programs, is appalling. Now, I see a bucket of people who do follow my advice and nothing ever happens to them. Then I see all the people who can't or won't follow my advice and they whittle away bits of their heart to their premature death. It's a decision. And so their health span is dreadful and their lifespan is also dreadful. But the key to both is what we've just been talking about. There's some other things you can do as well, but that's the real key to both, those five keys. Um, Dr. Walker, uh, we talked, you touched on, and I definitely want to speak about this because I think it, it's such a you know, big moment in time. When Shane Warne died and they said it was from a heart attack, I think it, it set a, an electrical shock to every middle-aged man in Australia, uh, oh, but phone. also to middle-aged women because if your partner is a middle-aged man and you know he's supposedly fit and just le leading a normal Aussie lifestyle, to have you know someone who um, the media is eulogised as an icon and you know um, so important to us culturally, drop dead on a holiday in Thailand, is it, pretty horrific and a stark reminder of our need for testing, our need mm. for awareness around our heart health. And also yep. the limitations of our bodies. Um, yep. you, you touched on testing. I'm interested to know your thoughts on what are some non-invasive tests that everybody over the age of 40 needs to invest in? Well, before that, can we just go back to these three serious, uh, three prominent deaths we've had in the last couple of weeks? The death of Rod Marsh, who was in his 70s. But the death of Shane Warne and Kimberly Kitching, the Labor Centre, the well-respected Labor Centre. Yes, Center, absolutely, yes. Both, both of them died at 52, both of them. And 52 is not, not old. That's a young age. But let's look at Shane's case. Then I'll talk about how it could have been prevented. Um, firstly, Shane was a heavy smoker through most of his life. I don't know if, if he was smoking at the time of his death, but he would. I, I've spoken to people who knew him very well. I'd never actually met him. His parents were friend of, friends of mine, but I, I'd ne not actually met Shane. But he, he smoked up to 50, 60 cigarettes a day. He's incredibly heavy smoker. Well, I had we, met him and he was definitely smoking when I met him. Yeah, and, and it looks, in my view, come the revolution, I'm running the show, cigarettes would be banned. They just shouldn't be sold. They, they should, they're, to me, they're a legal pro product. I'd make them illegal. They should be banned. But, but that, So that's the first point. He was a heavy smoker. The second point, he had a dreadful diet. And, and the other thing was that he also went onto one of these detox diets. And, and when, when people want to lose weight rapidly, that's okay in your 20s and 30s. But once you get beyond 40, your metabolism's changed. If you've got a bit of abdominal obesity and you want to shed that quickly, what happens? And, and the abdominal obesity isn't just an ugly lump of lard. It's a toxic reservoir that's held on to all of the dreadful chemicals we've been exposed to over the years. We were designed to walk around that jungle, no synthetic chemicals at all. 
but we get exposed to heavy metals, to plastics, to dioxins, a whole lot of rubbish. And that sits in our abdominal fat in an inert state doing nothing. But then if you lose it quickly, not slowly, lose it quickly, you're pouring all this stuff into your central circulation. Wow, okay, the that, is it. that is the first time I've heard it explained that way. And it can make the plaques rupture. So if you imagine a plaque, there's a, a donut with a hole in it. That's where the blood's going. But all the fat's sitting in the wall dormant until you stir it up. And I want to get onto that in a second, but that's really important. You stir it up, then it goes. Boom. So a heart attack isn't a slow blockage. It's a sudden rupture. And there's always a stress precipitant that ruptures that. That stress could be emotional stress. It could be mental stress. It could be physical stress. It could be pharmacologic stress. So, I, for example, I had a guy in his 30s uh, with a strong family history of heart disease, went out one night on a Bucks party, had a few lines of Coke, major heart attack, wiped out half his heart. And it can be in this pandemic era, an infective stress. So what I'm saying with Shane, he had pain, allegedly, in the week or two before he died. So instead of going to a hospital and having a stent or a bypass, he goes to Thailand. So is it a shock that Shane Warne died? Not in the slightest. Is it a tragedy? Of course it is. It's a tragedy when anyone dies. And Shane was the best leg spinner or the best spinner, spin bowler the world has ever seen. The man was a freak on the cricket field, but he didn't look after himself and he did not get his chest pain addressed. And he went on to a fad diet, which I think is dangerous over the age of 40. So when, if anyone wants to lose weight, they should do it slowly, not like that. So part of the conversation that I have um, and, and the research that I'm doing for the Ageless platform around testing is um, genetic testing. I had genetic testing for the first time, I want to say about 13 years ago with 23andMe. And I've since had an updated genetic testing with a company called DNA Power over in Canada. And yeah. what I loved about that test is that they made fantastic lifestyle, health, diet, exercise um, recommendations that would overlay, you know, my genetic predisposition, which thank God was uh, really good uh, to all of the major aging diseases, and then overlay it with changes that I can make. So my epigenetics could come into play and, and help improve sure. my longevity and also my health. Um, yeah. So we talked about um, the cardiovascular testing. What, what are you, and you, touched on then genetics and then the lifestyle factors. What are your thoughts on what's fixed with our genetics and the role of epigenetics in changing our destiny? Right. Well, firstly, just before I get into that, just can I say calcium score is one thing, appropriate blood tests are another because you mentioned genetics. 70% of heart disease is due to insulin resistance, which is the gene that occurs in 30% of Caucasians, 50% of Asians and 100% of people with darker skin. And that sets you up for diabetes, blood pressure, high triglyceride, low HDL in your cholesterol, fat around the belly, and then all the things, cardiovascular disease, fatty liver, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 20% is due to lipoprotein little a. And lipoprotein little a occurs in one in five people, markedly increases your risk for heart disease. So therefore, two genes explains 90% of heart disease, two genes. Dr. Ross, to finish, I want to ask you, uh, kind of in a continuation of our lunch conversation, um, how far away do you think we are on developing anti-aging medication, like proper drugs or uh, a course of supplements that will really impact uh, cellular wellness, regeneration, rejuvenation, that's both for inside and out? I think that we're already there. I think we already have them. So we have now... Very good. So, for example, there's a very exciting new supplement called Hobamine that maintains DNA repair. So, so we've got that. We've, What's that we've called got, again? Hobamine. Hobamine. H O B A M I N E. And and so I take a supplement every day that has this in it. I have a take the NMN and, and nicotinic acid, and also there's a thing called Fisetin that that improves this the the health of the sen, uh, senolytics or senolytic breakdown, the senescent cells. So I think we already have the supplements and the work, work of, of geniuses like David Sinclair will only make this better as time goes on. But I already think we have the stuff. We already have the armamentarium to, to improve our aging because if you can treat aging, so Dave Sinclair says, aging is a disease. It's a disease that can be detected. It's a disease that can be treated and managed. And so reversed. You, and reversed. And reversed. 
Yeah, so if you treat aging at that level, treat DNA repair, give your cells more energy, break down those senescent cells and stop them from, from feeding off the rest of the body. If you do that, and we already have the, the facilities to do that now, we can then stop the next level, which is the aging cells then degenerating into heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis. It's already there for people to do, but it just requires discipline and effort by firstly keeping your lifestyle tight and then the discipline of swallowing some supplements every day. It's not difficult, but it just requires effort.